15 seconds to get yourselves settled. Um, Thank you. Thank you again for coming. My name is Mark Schmidt. I'm the director of the political reform program here at New America, and I'm pleased to welcome you to an event that's really uh, an event of the Fellows Program uh, here. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, the topic of the undemocratic state, uh, race, and the lessons of American history. And, the, and, and I think this, this is a conversation that had its origins in, um, I think, a conversation on Twitter, as many things like this do, uh, which was a conversation about how some scholars and observers and journalists were uh, kind of felt like the threats to democracy in the U.S. were new and, and challenging and a surprise uh, to us, and, uh, and others pointed out that particularly scholars of race and ethnicity have been thinking about these challenges for a long time and think about them in the context of, of, of Reconstruction and, and Jim Crow and, and, uh, and, and many other periods where uh, the fundamental promise of democracy has been, uh, has been limited for, for a, great, uh, a great many people. And, and it's a very timely question. I got an interesting Twitter thing about the, uh, there was a, an article proposing that, you know, it, we, the Democratic Party would be better off if it hadn't embraced Hubert Humphrey's call to become the party of civil rights uh, in, in 1948. And that led to, you know, an enormous, I, I learned a lot actually just from, from poking that uh, question and people had some, some, some interesting viewpoints about that. Um, so we have a, a real range here of, of uh, people, some affiliated with New America, and I will just, uh, I'll, I'll introduce them fairly quickly, and then I'll and then I'll turn it over and and, and sit down with the with the rest of you all. Um, Didi Quo is here, uh, who is a a fellow in the New America Fellows Program right now, uh, an Eric and Wendy Schmidt fellow, writing a book about the collapse of political parties across Western democracies and the implications for democratic reform. Uh, she manages the program on American democracy and comparative perspective at Stanford's uh, Center on Democracy Development and the Rule of Law working with Frank Fukuyama, Larry Diamond, and other, uh, and, and other folks. So it's really, you know, she really uh, is deep in the territory of uh, looking at American democracy in a, in a comparative context. Um, and then uh, I'm going to just, I'm about to introduce you, Marcia. So uh, uh, come, and, uh, come and join us. Uh, Marcia Chatelain is, uh, is, has also been a fellow at New America uh, and has been uh, writing a, a book that, it's one of those things that as soon as I, I, not something I'd ever thought about, and as soon as you think about it, it's like, whoa, that's super fascinating, uh, which is uh, really visions of racial and economic justice around the fast food industry and the role of McDonald's and McDonald's ownership and, and franchising as an instrument of the, of the black middle class over history. It's one of the, you, you know, we'll, we have to get her to talk about it a little bit because it's super fascinating. Um, Kimberly Johnson is professor of social, and she's also, uh, she's also a professor at Georgetown, uh, among other things, and is, has been here a few times. Some of you have probably seen her here before. Uh, Kimberly Johnson is professor of social and cultural analysis at NYU, uh, previously the director of the Barnard Columbia Ur Urban Studies Program. Uh, she's working on a new book called The Rise and Fall of Chocolate City, Oakland, Newark, and the Future of Metropolitan America, um, and has also written about uh, 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 black suburbanization. And finally, um, and finally, Ted Johnson is uh, also a, a, a former New America fellow, writing about the variations of, of black political behavior and attitudes, um, also something I've learned a ton from, and he is... He is now a fellow at the Brennan Center for Justice, which is an organization we're always proud to uh, to work closely with and 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 have friends over there. So uh, uh, Ted's also a 20-year veteran of the of the military as well as uh, as well as also a PhD in political science. So we're we're thrilled to have this whole group. And uh, Ted, you're going to moderate, and I'll let you I'll let you run with it. Thank you all. All right. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you all for being here. Um, again, I'm just going to moderate and let the the brilliant sort of run the conversation, uh, and I'll get to sit and watch and learn along with the rest of you. Uh, so what we hope to do today, though, is talk a little bit about our, the current state of our democracy. It seems like our news cycle is filled with how our democratic norms are eroding and our institutions are falling apart and our processes are breaking down, and uh, even talk of a constitutional crisis, you know, um, depending on who fires whom and, um, and, and what else is happening. Uh, and so what comparative politics it, it does is it examines uh, 
um, it provides insights into these institutions or politics, uh, usually through the lens of how um, these things compare to other nations and how they've experienced them, as well as longitudinally, longitudinally through time uh, of a specific nation. Um, but the question we want to wrangle with today is what lessons are there to be learned when a nation within a nation experiences a, a, um, a misfiring democracy or a dem or democratic backsliding, uh, specifically for racial minorities in the United States, um, we are very familiar with what happens when a democratic state does not do what it's supposed to do, what eroding norms and processes and institutions look like. So what lessons are there to be gleaned from the, the population within the United States that can perhaps shed insight onto the larger national narrative and, um, and be compared against what other nations have experienced? Uh, and so that's, that's the, the goal for today. Uh, and so what I'd like to do is just to start with you, Dee Dee, um, and just to sort of introduce uh, your thoughts on the topic, and then we'll go from Dee Dee to Marcia to, to Kim, and then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get rolling with the uh, conversation. Great. Thank you, Ted, and thank you to all of you for coming and turning out for <coughs> what we think is a really important conversation. I'm just going to describe sort of the, the reason for a comparative perspective today and why it's been seen as so necessary. Um, Trump poses a sort of uniquely destabilizing threat in the United States against a backdrop of sort of democratic decline or weakness over the past few years or maybe even decades. We've had rising political polarization between our parties such that voters are sorted into these camps that are incredibly antagonistic. And the parties, of course, have been negotiating and compromising less. There's also rising income inequality, and that income inequality is very much tied to racial inequality, but has been discussed both in terms of you know, decline of white working class jobs, um, as well as the worsening off of racial minorities, particularly black and Latinos in the United States. And there's been declining faith in all sorts of democratic institutions. Americans don't trust parties. They don't trust Congress. Uh, they really don't believe that their elected leaders are working for them. So this is not true just in the US, but around the world. And we've seen a rise in far-right parties and in populism, even in countries that have been long stable democracies, like the advanced democracies of Western Europe. Um, the problematic things about Trump in particular and his rhetoric is that they follow a sort of illiberal playbook that's been set by people like Viktor Orban of Hungary and to a much worse extent, people like Erdogan in Turkey and of course autocrats like Putin um, and Xi Jinping. But you, know, you have a typical authoritarian model that's considered totally irrelevant to the United States because autocrats rule with repression and total uh, centralization of the law and arbitrary enforcement of that law and power, um, whereas typically we think that democratic leaders are accountable to their people. Whereas the rise of Viktor Orban and the far right parties, the way their rhetoric works in Europe, is that they can attack long-standing democratic institutions like the media, they can go after the courts, they can centralize a lot of power with economic elites. So they erode um, a potential mechanism of accountability when governments are unstable. Uh, and Trump has done exactly this. Since his campaign and his candidacy, he has attacked the media, he's decried the press and fake news, and we now see him actually going after the merger of AT&T and Time Warner precisely because he dislikes CNN, not because he dislikes Monopoly. Um, he has obviously attacked the FBI. It remains to be seen whether or not he'll fire Rosenstein or Mueller, Mueller but you know, either one of those could constitute a huge legitimacy problem for the nation. Um, he has attacked the courts, going after Judge Curiel, for example, for his racial background, uh, claiming that he's not able to be fully independent. Um, and he's obviously been openly racist. So he's engaged in racially hostile rhetoric. He has de denounced specific groups for being murderers or rapists. Um, and he has you know, gone after any number of black figures, for example, uh, a mother of a deceased soldier, um, in various ways that are maybe coded and, and maybe not coded. And he's talked about jailing his opponent, so he in some ways attacks the legitimacy of democratic elections. And finally, he has a model of personal business enrichment in the form of the Trump Organization and not disavowing himself from his business interests. This is something that's pretty unprecedented in the United States. There are plenty of leaders across the developing world who merge their personal interests with the state's interests in the form of kleptocracy or plutocracy. Um, and it's really testing what the institutional constraints are on a president who wants to do that, because we don't really have laws 
governing the separation of business interests and political interests at the executive level. Um, so when people are worried about a backsliding of democracy in the United States, it's typically with reference to democratic backsliding in established democracies where we see leaders using democratic institutions to come to power, but then once they have power, uh, trying to undermine the legitimacy of a lot of other foundational institutions within democratic society. Very good, Marcia. So I'm a, I'm a historian, and one of the things that is so challenging about my craft is that on one hand, um, people think it's about the collection of a series of interesting facts. And often, um, I think our role as historians is to understand the analytic value of history. And so as I, as I sit here um, in this current political moment, I have to really kind of, it, it's a very difficult task as a historian to watch this unfold because we don't want to fall into the lazy impulse and say that this moment is, could be predicted because history is just a cycle, right? And so we're just in our backlash phase um, because that's inadequate to a longer history and a longer story. And it's also very difficult to rest on this idea of, um, of uh, change, progress, triumph as this kind of linear process. So I think for a lot of historians, we just have a lot of stomach aches right now because <laughs> um, like I often like to say, every, year, every day we wake up in a new year um, and a new reference point. And increasingly, our country is in 1866. I mean, this is, this is the post kind of Civil War moment in which the bad actors of the, nat of the nation need to be um, catered to in order to um, preserve, I think, this false idea of a democratic nation. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to slide into 1877 at the end of Reconstruction. But this idea that we have ever been a unified nation or we need to be a unified nation in order to function, I think is one of the dangers of this moment. Because what it does is it creates these narratives of a golden era of X. And what made this, these eras so golden was that they were built on the exclusion of people of color. And so one of the things that I'm very nervous about is this idea that return is what's going to restore the democracy that never existed. And so perhaps we have to be more radical in our imagination of what's possible instead of using these reference points of the past. But what can history do in terms of helping us think about this moment and our relationship to democratic institutions? Uh, I think that what history has shown us is that if we look at every presidency, if we look at the building and sustenance of the nation, this current president is probably the most American president that has ever existed. Because he is an amalgam, I think, of more than 200 years of history and impulses kind of brought together in one figure, right? Um, the commitment to white supremacy, the deep desire um, to close borders in order to um, give people a sense of security, this idea that um, institutions are really not about the people, but kind of the interests of capitalists. I mean, these are, these are pretty consistent American practices, even if we think of them as antithetical to American ideals or values. And I think that this is the discomfort that many people across a wide ideological spectrum are trying to contend with. And in trying to contend with that, I think that there has been a lot of excuse making and a lot of ahistorical analysis about this president either being an anomaly or the appeal of this president is something that, that um, necessitates our compassion or our understanding. Um, I think the line needs to be drawn. Had, there was a need for the line to be drawn a while ago, but I think in this present moment, if we do not have a strong core of intellectually sound voices that are historically grounded to say, actually, this is consistent with the history of the nation, and this is what makes it a problem in order for us to have a vision for a newer nation, a nation that actually is able to be consistent with the ideals, we're going to be stuck in these traps and these cycles of history. Very good, Kim. 
so I started my book, Reforming Jim Crow, Southern Politics and State and Nation. So if you know V.O. Key, it really is kind of a response to and an a long conversation with V.O. Key's work. Um, and the book started in a, in a moment where I was trying to think about the American state. So I, I do political scientists. I'm a political scientist. I do a, a field called American Political Development. And it's all about how do we understand the growth of the American state in comparison, say, to other social welfare states like the UK or, or France or et cetera. So just a comparative perspective. And my thought was, how do we understand the growth of the state in Oh, in, a, in, in our place in which we have these deep entrenched inequalities. Um, and so I started thinking about how do we explain the growth of state capacity? How do we understand the growth of what it means to sort of engage in rulemaking um, in a place in which there was legal segregation? So if I'm a librarian, for example, and I go to librarian school and I'm taught the ethics of being a librarian, how do I square that with the fact that I'm going to be working in a segregated library system? So how do we kind of square these kinds of things of professionalization with, uh, with, with this reality of, of segregation? And that made me start to think about other things. So I'm going to just show really quickly. Um, did it work? Or did it not work? Oh, there it is. So just to provide some context to think about time and cycles. So this is a, uh, this is a chart of African American voting from 1880 to 2004. And you'll notice a huge disruption, right? From 1880 to what is called the nadir of about 1910. Um, and then this kind of long, slow call back up to 1960 which is, not surprisingly, the Voting Rights Act. So what does this tell us? This tells us, I think, a couple of things. One is the sort of triumphalist uh, de-democratization, disenfranchisement, and then the sort of emergence of the modern civil rights movement, and then African Americans kind of get the vote again. But I, what I want to perhaps suggest is that we not only think about this moment or that moment as kind of the end of an era, but also the unfolding of a new era. Mm -hmm. That is, I, I talk about, we talk about the end of Reconstruction, but I think we also need to talk about redemption. Mm -hmm. That redemption wasn't simply, oh, all of a sudden we had segregation overnight. All of a sudden we had defunding of African-American education. What I want to suggest is that we actually had the creation of a segregated state. Um, and that segregated state was not simply people acting not nicely to each other, i.e. individual prejudice, but it really was an act of state building. Um, and so that moment, if you look at the, the chart, 1910 is a really important date because that's the last uh, year that southern states all change their constitutions mm -hmm. to disenfranchise African Americans. They, all they mostly all included laws that essentially created segregated living, segregated education, segregated boxing. I mean, all sorts of mm -hmm. things that we now look back on and say, oh, that's kind of <coughs> crazy. And so what I, what I think, at this moment, what I think about is what are the ways in which these moments of, of illiberalism, of de-democratization, um, how do they happen? And then what are the forces that are even in that moment of illiberalism working to sort of push back, working for openings to kind of see what can we do to change? So I usually am not an optimistic person, <laughs> but in these days I'm trying very hard. Um, so what I think I want to suggest is that even if we might be at this moment of illiberalism and democratic backsliding, that we can also look to the past to imagine possibilities and opportunities that might not be so obvious to us. Yeah, I, and so, um, so I want to start with, with Dee Dee, um, and especially given the news this morning that Paul Ryan is retiring from Congress, or at least, he, well, he's retiring, he's not running again. Um, and this is the latest in a wave of retirements. Um, there was Corker, uh, Jeff Flake, Charlie Dent. My favorite was Trey Gowdy, who said, um, I'm leaving because I like jobs where facts matter, um, which is a good reason to, to leave, I think. Uh, and so, so it seems like the, the crumbling of our institutions, our processes, our in inability of, of Congress to accomplish things 
is a function of increasing partisanship and, mm -hmm. and, and partisan rancor. Uh, so can you talk to us a little bit about the role of parties in this disintegrating of democracy that seems to be slowly unfolding? Sure. I, parties are responsible for, um, I think, a lot of the current rise in disaffection towards democracy in general because parties have gone from being more, um, you know, sort of embedded in local communities and networks which are in a secular decline. Unions are in decline, religious organizations, a lot of different types of communities that used to sustain uh, local groups as, I mean, we now hear a lot about this because of the opioid crisis, but you had these places that were dense and had economic opportunities and are now in decline. Um, and parties used to be tied to those and now as they've become more nationalized, more reliant on activists and campaign donations and stuff, they're beholden to different kinds of groups. And I think that there's a representation gap where the average voter does not feel as if their needs are really met by either of the two parties. Um, but regarding race, it's been a little different because Southern Democrats used to be composed of both, you know, sort of liberal, left-leaning, uh, different types of political officials, but also the Southern Democrats who were the holdover of, I mean, they're the architects of this entire system of Jim Crow. Um, and then Republicans also used to be more of a mishmash of different factions. As you got more sorting of Southern Democrats into the Republican Party, you saw a rightward shift in the Republican Party and much more reliance on white identity politics, um, an active mobilization of you know, dog whistle politics, but now sort of like bullhorn racialized politics. Um, and Democrats, on the other hand, very much champions since FDR of racial minorities have also embraced a lot of elements of neoliberalism and center-right policies that since the 1980s and 1990s have done very little for um, different kinds of urban communities, very many, you know, working class voters of all economic stri or all racial stripes, but the point is that even though Democrats claim to be the parties of different racial groups, in fact, there are many liberals who say they relied too much on identity politics in 2016, um, it's unclear what legacy they have economically or policy-wise in terms of, you know, diffusing racism or being able to solve problems that are heavily racialized in the United States. So I think that in, um, in terms of parties, we have a mixed history of parties being able to be responsive to voters in an adequate way. And especially regarding race, the parties have, I think, been very attentive to the needs of white voters, particularly the Republican Party, and it's unclear how much they respond to voters of, who are racial minorities. Yeah. Yeah, it's so interesting um, because, I mean, parties, our democracy almost can't function with it, like, without them, um, but then they don't respond to the very folks that, that put them in office. And, but, but they appeal to them on social issues, economic issues. And, and so, Marsha, I wanted to ask, um, for example, in the Republican Party, th there's this sense that the free market will, can sort of cure some of the ills that mm -hmm. face America. Uh, there, uh, Gary Becker, noted economist, essentially said um, the market will correct <laughs> racial discrimination because it's bad for business. <laughs> he didn't say it would eliminate it. He just said it would, it's, it's bad business, and so it would reduce the incidence of it. Bless his heart. Well, and I think he <laughs> underestimated the, the uh, commitment of some folks to, to a racial discriminatory society. Uh, so, but, so you're writing about black capitalism, mm -hmm. essentially, and the role, and, and you know, within black America, there's a pretty strong strain of um, a belief that the government's never coming, the cavalry's never coming, and so we have to help ourselves. So can you talk about the interplay of economics, the black community, and, and the role it plays in governance? Yeah, I mean, I think um, to kind of think about um, the two points that were made previously, um, I think that we need to understand that white supremacy has a kind of, um, has a volume button. I think that the, or a knob rather, like I think that there is something in the kind of um, historical imagination of this nation that white supremacy is either burning crosses or, and then its opposite is racial like reconciliation and harmony. And if we don't understand the gradations of how white supremacy operates, we start to think that there can be a political party that has divested itself from white supremacy, and then there's a party that's committed to it. Mm -hmm. Rather than imagining a framework, and this goes into kind of my book, um, you know, I talk about African Americans in economics, and I'm critical of some choices, 
But what I'm most critical of are the fact that people are existing within a context of such constrained choices, that there's never an opportunity to actually test out the free market because no such thing exists, mm -hmm. that there's no ability to kind of fully articulate yourself as a citizen because no such thing exists, and that the power comes in the ingenuity and the creativity and the complicated and wrought decisions that have to be made within that framework. And I think for our political institutions, they do not see those survival strategies as something of value. They see this as something that is either naturalized and normalized. Of um, it, it becomes this kind of biological character instead of something that is both structurally bound. Right. And so all of this is to say, you know, um, the reason why I write about African Americans and fast food was I was tired of people judging the choices that people made about what they fed their kids or what they put in their bodies, right? Eating a hamburger isn't the problem. The problem is if your only choice is a hamburger. And if you made that hamburger, you may, you're not making a living wage. And if you have a business that sells that hamburger, that you can be a millionaire that's still racially redlined out of selling hamburgers in the suburbs, and that the police will still stop you, and they don't care if you own the place where the hamburgers are made. And all of these things are kind of locked together. And this is how this is the space in which people are making choices. And so you know, all of this is to say that when we look at what parties are saying to people, I think that um, there is a misunderstanding that the resistance on the part of people of color to the Republican Party is because they're, so not, they're not invested in the big social safety net. Neither are a lot of black voters exactly. either. I mean, here's, and this is why your work is so important, to complicate this idea of who the black voter is. Right. And to think about the fact that there is a critical mass of people who want to participate as citizens without, ra without white supremacy guiding all their moves, that's like the only ask that's really being made. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And that's what's so sick about our current state, that you can't even meet that demand. So that the Republican Party can't even have a coherent message that say, you know what, we don't think racialized violence is okay. And yeah. starting from that point, right. and then realizing that they can get black voters on some of these free market ideas, right. and some of this bootstraps nonsense, right? right? Like you can actually get people on that, but you have to say, you know what, racism is not cool. Right. And the inability <laughs> for both parties to make that clear and be consistent yeah. shows us where we are. And right. so, I mean, listen folks, not to sound the alarm, but this is really bad. And I think it's really mm -hmm. bad because um, all of the kind of political gymnastics that are being done right now to make anything, any of this OK is so appalling to me um, that it's not the fact that it's just appalling and wrong and shameful, but the fact that it is so effective, yeah. that it works so well, and that's why it's being done is the part that I think um, that we are we are stuck with that we have to grapple with. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so and so in thinking about, you know, there you go from the white supremacy framework nationally um, to to a more temporal consideration, which is where your book mm -hmm. comes in, and thinking about the constraints of Jim Crow, and you write about uh, how when you're when when actors black and white were bound in this framework they actually tried to make it work as best as they could for themselves, mm -hmm. um, understanding that if this is the lot we're given, you know, and, and so I think the way I read it in one of the reviews of your book said, you know, uh, to basically perfect separate but equal, to make it separate but more equal, it, it, to, to actually be the doctrine that it says it was that it never, never got to. So can you talk a little bit about the, the politics of operating within constrained frameworks where, where democracy is, is the mechanism but has not really been delivered, uh, and then how actors sort of you know, work within it, but then also use that as an incremental approach to achieve a better solution than, than the one that the framework they're operating within. So I, mean, I actually want to maybe pick up on that, that nice yeah. kind of <laughs> knob and tube. Um, uh, I mean, I don't think people under the age of 20. I know. Every, there's a group of young people are like, what are they talking about? It's a slider. It's sli yeah, slide um, left, a slide right. Um, but I mean, I think that that's some of the thing I was really fascinated by is that, again, in this context of we think of Jim Crow and, you know, we immediately go, rightly so, to lynching and to um, mass, uh, 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 the sort of uh, incarceration um, and all those sort of really 
visible and awful things about it. Um, and as opposed to, or in addition to, I should say, thinking about if you are um, an African American educator in that moment, what do you do? How do you sort of get education to your, to your children, to your students, to the fellow community members? Um, and you have to sort of figure this out, right? You have to sort of, you can A, try to bootstrap it, but you can also say, well, let me see what kinds of resources can I tap? And then you sort of try to figure out what are, who are these sort of allies that I can get? Um, and what you end up getting is sort of a strange set, a sort of strange set of bedfellows um, mm -hmm. in which Southern reformers, and again, these are not you know, kumbaya people. These are people who are very much, would not be in tune with what racial egalitarianism of today. But they're, they, in some ways, were moderate because they really were ones who saw that kind of high, high you know, number 11 um, uh, knob ranking uh, of, um, of white supremacy as being kind of rude and unpleasant. Mm -hmm. Um, and so it was almost this kind of genteel racism. So how can we sort of have this sort of segregated world but not have these sort of awful, tacky people in, in white robes kind of running around? Um, and so it ends up being this kind of very strange alliance where these white reformers um, who prided themselves on being sort of the reform wing, working with African Americans who are trying to sort of figure out how do we deliver public services. Because I think one of the things I really want to emphasize about that chart behind me is that when African Americans lose the vote, they actually literally lose access to public services. That you can actually look in a number of cities and look at school funding and segregated black and white schools in 1880 and then that same school in 1900 and the, rank, and the, and the, and the uh, per capita uh, funding has gone from say $3 per African American student to 50 cents per African American student. So it really is an important thing to sort of recognize that the loss of the vote is not simply the loss of the ability to sort of influence political parties. It literally is the loss of the ability to get access to public resources. So I think that what I, what I look at in my book is I look at the ways in which uh, anti-lynching efforts not only came from the you know, courageous and amazing work of, of folks like Ida B. Wells, but also from the American so Southern Association of Women Against Lynching, mm -hmm. um, who basically tried to engage in a shaming campaign um, to get uh, their white husbands and brothers to sort of sign pledges to stop lynching. Um, I look at um, the ways in which educators basically opened the door to the beginning of Brown by saying, well, okay, if you really want separate, then you really have to make it equal. And what uh, state and local uh, education systems found is that they literally couldn't afford it. Sure. You can't afford separate and equal systems. You can't do it. Um, and then um, I think the other thing that's also really interesting is, again, thinking about that long climb back up towards um, voting participation is that it became actually kind of attractive for some white politicians, mm -hmm. not in the Deep South, but certainly on the Outer South, Virginia, North Carolina, places like that, to kind of tentatively seek out black votes. Mm -hmm. um, it turned out that black votes could actually swing an election if you had a 1,000 here or a 1,000 there. So I think that the story about how do we get to sort of 1965 from the nadir of, mm -hmm. of 1910 is actually kind of a, a much more complicated story about difficult and strange mm -hmm. alliances that have to be made. Hmm. So I guess in some ways that Becker thesis works out. It's, if it's too yeah. expensive to support two, like the black high school and the white one, you reduce, you know, it eventually works its way towards integration along with some, some other things. Um, but uh, the, the road's not, the, the path's not right. that straight. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it for us that. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah, right. Uh, so, so Didi, I, I want to, um, and then sort of just open up to the group for conversation to talk uh, a bit about how economic inequality impacts our, our society. Uh, there was a, a couple years ago, there was a, pay, a, a paper from Guylands and Page yeah. talk testing theories of, of democracy, where they basically say what we all kind of know in our hearts, that our public policy apparatus is responsive to economic elites and business, uh, organized business interests. And the average citizen and the mass-based movement mm -hmm. basically has no in influence on what public policy uh, eventually emerges from, from our government. 
So, and, and so when you compound that with the economic equality in our society, what, you know, where do we go from here if, uh, you know, for, for the average Americans like us that just want a functioning government? Uh, so that is not at all a big question. Yeah, right. um, yeah that's right. <laughs> that's a great question. And uh, so one weird thing about America in general is that American voters think differently about economic inequality than, say, in Europe, where typically when you have rising inequality, you get more calls on the left for redistribution of some sort, um, some way of equalizing the playing field um, and taking power back from you know, economic or political elites, whereas in the United States, inequality is something that's considered sort of natural because we have this sort of laissez-faire market and right. the bootstrap narrative and all of these things. Um, and so, and given the history also of race in this country, today economic inequality, again, is very racialized, but this is something that most politicians just totally neglect to talk about or care about or I highlight in that way. Um, so economic inequality is both, you know, it's sort of, it was political scientists, we would say it's endogenous to the political system, meaning you ought to have, if you look at the distribution of preferences of what Americans want in terms of, say, taxation, redistribution, the welfare state, various kinds of economic policy, Americans are way to the left of where both of the political parties are. They are the parties that um, their policy preferences on redistribution tend to really favor just the affluent, and that's who has mm. a lot of say in policy making. Uh, in the United States. And it's the kind of thing where it just fosters more of a feeling of distrust and a feeling of marginalization from politics. You know, the poor in America are much less likely to vote than someone who's affluent in the first place, not to talk, and when you go up the chain of political involvement, of more ways to be involved, that becomes more and more true. So the question is, how do we convince political leaders that you ought to mobilize and be responsive to voters who are not incredibly affluent, you know, uh, who form the mass constituency base that you lead. And I think that this is really hard to do, and this is where the question of alliances and leadership both come into play, because, you know, the Republicans have been very effective at um, reducing the electorate, right? They have, since Jim Crow, they, where they actively just disenfranchised part of the population, they now have been very effective at passing voter ID and felon disenfranchisement is in both states. Um, there are various policies that Democrats are just not responsive to. I mean, Democrats cared much more in the 2016 platform of rolling back Citizens United or these kinds of sort of pie in the sky ideas about campaign finance rather than being responsive to voter disenfranchisement, um, for example. So I th think it's difficult to say what will motivate leaders to be more responsive um, to both issues of economic inequality and issues of race. But uh, that's really my question for Marsha and Kimberly, are yeah. periods in history where these things happened. So I think the national addiction to forgetting has imperiled the political parties. Yeah. Um, like because I, I'm, you know, I'm listening to kind of you know, what the parties are, what they reinvent something every four years as this will be the thing that compels people as if we live on a four-year cycle, right? So if you were poor four years ago, you're probably poor today, and you probably were poor eight years ago and 12 years ago, right? Um, so it, it just makes me, I mean, I think that the forgetting causes us to underestimate the power of rhetoric over substance. And I think about this in terms of the period that you study, in terms of rumors of someone making eyes at someone <coughs> ends in the murder, of the public murder. Of, a, of an African-American woman or child or man, right? Um, that the rumor of school integration causes someone to burn down an entire school building, right? And so I think that um, what has happened over the past few decades is that the thing that, you know, Ted, you're hinting at is progress for some people of color has come at the expense of a lot of people of color, but that little bit of progress I think it quickens the forgetting that what was at stake, what was trying to be preserved by the racialized violence and about some of the behavior. And so I think where we are right now is that um, we can't imagine an electorate voting against its own interests. Or we can't imagine that people would believe that this president cares about anyone in West Virginia, let alone anyone who's suffering from you know, opioid addiction. Um, I, I was in conversation with Kianga Yamada-Taylor who wrote 
from Black Lives Matter to Black Liberation, and she said, you know, one of the things that she thinks is interesting is that people have rightly critiqued concern of, about the opioid addiction crisis and saying, you know, it's incredibly racist because when there was a crack addiction, no one wanted sympathy or support. But she says, few people go to the next level of analysis to show that the government really hasn't put any money into this crisis. Mm -hmm. They are not regulating the pharmaceutical firms. They're not prosecuting the doctors. The president of the United States says drug dealers are going to get the death penalty. Like, so the, the, so all of this is to say the artifice is actually quite effective mm -hmm. when the interests and what's being preserved is this kind of race-based access to power. And like, we forget that, right? We forget that all of those people who were burning down that school building or who were out in front of Little Rock, um, they were getting unhinged because nine black students were going to enter those schools. A lot of those people, they weren't going to Little Rock Central either. But that wasn't the point. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think that what makes me nervous is that we both overestimate and underestimate what is at stake and why this message, why the empty, um, disgusting, and like base message that has allowed for this president to win the White House, why it's also not seductive and credibly intoxicating when we look at um, what it is imagining it can preserve. Yeah. Any thoughts? Yeah. So, um, so many thoughts. I mean, I think <laughs> that one of the interesting things, you know, as I dipped into Southern history, you sort of get caught up a little bit into sort of the debates among Southern historiographers. And um, so just the other day, I was looking at C. Van Woodward, origin, mm -hmm. she, you know, <laughs> um, origins of the South. And I think one of the things that really is the puzzle at that moment, right, looking at that kind of late 19th century moment, is that you have this sort of populace, right? And it's this sort of possibility of a grand white working class African American coalition that will sweep into power and sort of dislodge the sort of urban Democrats, mm -hmm. right? And it fails. And then what you end up getting is you end up getting these previous populists like Ben Tillman who end up being these incredible racial reactionaries. And I think that's sort of the, the haunting moment of, of Southern history is there was this possibility of kind of putting to the side or at least acknowledging yet confronting economic inequality. Um, and I think that, again, I think this potency of white supremacy. Um, it is, as many people have said, including Malcolm X, it's an incredible drug. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that one of the things that Democrats, the sort of FDR Democrats were able to do is that they were able to sort of capitalize on this spectacular economic growth mm -hmm. and dampen down that sort of white supremacy because they were able to deliver the economic goods. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so in that sense, do I become a Gary Becker? <laughs> I don't know. Um, but I mean, I do think that that is what is remarkable about this kind of moment of kind of post-World War II exceptionalism, is that economic growth did help facilitate this kind of move away from illiberalism mm -hmm. and greater democratization. And, and can I add, though, the cost, right? When we think about the cost of post-war economic boom, boom, it was the cost of the sacrifice of the war, but it wasn't going to cost you in terms of school integration, mm. housing integration. It wasn't going to cost you, right? And so I think that what has happened now, which has been quite disappointing mm -hmm. with a lot of the Democrats and, and people on the left who say, well, identity politics sunk us. Mm -hmm. This is an old narrative, <laughs> right. but BT dubs. Like, <laughs> identity <laughs> politics is what we call it now, but it was the Negro vote. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, Eleanor Roosevelt meeting with um, black women's clubs, right? It's. Mm -hmm not too much of this because mm -hmm. this group of people are going to imperil the entire mm -hmm. ship, right? It's the family that stays in the neighborhood when it integrates versus leaves. It's the two white families that stay in the school instead of leave. Right. And those people pay a cost, and that cost is broadcast mm -hmm. to a lot of people. Right. Like, this will harm you if you do this, and I think that this is one of the great lessons that is passed down to every generation of whites, how you consolidate your power. And it can be done in very soft ways or very hard ways, but you are taught by this country how to keep your power. And I think this is what we're seeing played out in the political parties. And, and I think this, it's a, I think it's a, a real fear. I, I mean, um, the, the Atlantic article that Mark hinted at essentially said when the Democrats decided that civil rights would become an issue, um, they threw away a certain segment of their voting. 
and whether or not you know going you know <laughs> being pro civil rights like taking the morality out of the issue, mm -hmm. the argument is it was bad politics for a party. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and in your book, you write how even as as incremental progress uh, occurred within the Jim Crow construct, it actually crumbled Jim Crow because as people got a taste of it, they wanted more, and it got the wheels in motion for for more. So uh, I guess, but my my question, my next question, kind of is. Um, despite all of these imperfections in our society and inequalities, democracy has proved pretty resilient for our very young history uh, through a civil war, a huge social transformation during the civil rights movement, and, and like the, the three or four decades worth of civil rights movements, uh, uh, movement that happened in you know, the, the culminating moment of, mm -hmm. of the mid-60s. Uh, so is our democracy really in trouble, or is this just the next thing we have to, to surmount to, to keep the country intact, or is this one different from, from the past? Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think one thing I, I really wanted to make a, a big thing about today is, um, so one of the things that happens as a result of the sort of new state constitutions in the South is the imposition of the poll tax. Um, the poll tax not only basically helps to wipe out the African-American vote, it actually helps to wipe out the white working class vote. Right. Um, so. If you imagine a place like Virginia um, or Alabama where it's cumulative uh, and you have to pay over three years, it actually turned out to be like $20. If you're a southern farmer at that moment, your average income is about $500. So you actually don't have enough money to pay the poll tax. And if you have enough money to pay the poll tax, it's for one person in your family and it's going to be the head of the family, the male. And so what happens, particularly in, after the World War II, is that white women start saying, hey, wait a minute, I'd like to vote, I should vote. And the League of Women Voters actually takes on the poll tax and poll tax reform as one of its signature issues. Um, and it's the movement and the push of these white women voters or would-be voters to dismantle the poll tax that helps to kind of present the idea that, oh, wait a minute, we have a restricted democracy. Um, and that delegitimizes in some ways the notion that, oh, only some people should have the right mm -hmm. to vote. So it's a long-term process, um, but I think that um, I don't want to lose sight of possibility. I know I'm being way too optimistic. No, I, I'm <laughs> right there with you. My friends and family are like probably looking at this going, oh my god, who's that person? Well, I don't want to be more pessimistic. I mean, I, I want to be optimistic, but it's, you know, the U.S. was able to be democratic during the entire period of Jim Crow. I mean, like anyone would have looked at <laughs> right, the okay. US and said, oh, what a great democracy. And like nationally, that was sort of our right. thinking about it. And so you know, there's this Professor Robert Mickey who's written this book called Paths Out of Dixie, where he said we had these brown areas of governance where we had a very effective right. and strong repressive state that was totally authoritarian in the South against this backdrop nationally mm -hmm. of a, a democratic state. And I think that you know democracy will probably survive Trump. I mean, we have this conference over the next few days asking if it will. I think it will. <laughs> but you know, the question is, democracy. We still have economic inequality. We right. still mm -hmm. have police brutality. Like all of these things that no political leaders want to, you know, really bring to light or do anything about in a substantive way. Um, and so we can have democracy with ongoing racial hierarchy and white supremacy, mm -hmm. what will it take for Marsha's calls for us to think creatively about really meeting American ideals and values through trying to dismantle these like institutionalized and systematic power structures? Mm -hmm. That I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I think, the, I think the fantasy of democracy continues because it's a hell of a drug, right? <laughs> um, but what I do think, what concerns me the most if we accept that the democracy is imperfect, but some institutions do rise, and people rise, and communities rise, and I don't want to lose sight of the, the incredible work that we see with people on the ground building and moving and creating in the face of so much repression. I don't want to lose sight of that. But what I fear is that this moment has now allowed um, the kind of extra state, I don't know how to say it, the kind of non-state actors to be even more powerful mm -hmm. in maintaining the inequality. Mm -hmm. So if the free market mm -hmm. could allegedly correct racial inequality, the free market does a really good job of exacerbating yeah, it absolutely. as well. That's and right. so when we have this type of presidency, when we have this type of shift in kind of what is discursively acceptable, 
then we have more opportunities for the free market, um, for extensions of the state, like the police, mm -hmm. to do its, you know, its extraordinary violence on others. And so I think <laughs> right. that when we think about undoing the, this era, because the, the impulse to forget the Trump years will be strong. Mm -hmm. And we will rewrite the narrative. No matter what Bozo becomes president next, it'll be like, this was just a moment where the US had lost its way, but now Bozo is going to like, you know, get us out of the depths, <laughs> right? But what we, what we will lose sight of is that there are things that have already unfolded to undo that damage requires a really deep reckoning of how that damage was allowed to happen right. and the yeah. way that mm -hmm. the markets will exacerbate and capitalize on that, that type of damage. Um, I'm just going to, my last comment, I'm going to stop. I, I just, you know, Richard Spencer was yeah. on my campus this yeah. week. Right. He showed up at an event. Richard Spencer showed up at an event um, at my university. It wasn't his event, but he was a member of the audience, like he could be here right now, and he asked a question. It was a conversation about the alt-right. And that experience really kind of illuminated for me what happens when the discourse shifts just a little bit and its incredible chilling effect on people. Mm -hmm. That mm -hmm. a period of time as a professor, I would have never imagined that a white supremacist who had organized a terrorist attack at a place where my colleagues work and live would be so emboldened and free to show up at an event and, and even had dared to speak, and that I would have to contend with someone saying, well, you know, ideas, he's talking about a group oh. of people we ignored. This is why I've kind of had it, because this is the small scale, I guess no big deal, consequence of when there is not clarity about where the line is and what is at stake. I just wanted to tell a bunch of people that because I was so, <laughs> it, it was just so infuriating. But this is like, this is where we are. Yeah. And if everyone doesn't have a collective sense of shame about it, yeah. I don't know what the impulse will be to really kind of be clear about what is happening in this country. Right. And if incrementalism can help undo unpopular, like uh, undo non democratic things, it can also help build a wall to yep. protect, you know, those mm -hmm. non democratic things. Um, and so I, to your point, this is just a, another incremental march towards what we say we don't want to be. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to open it up to questions. Uh, there will be folks walking around with microphones. So raise your hand if you have a question. Um, state your name, where you're from, and, and keep it short and succinct. Um, and uh, I, I do want to sort of roll into the question session um, with a question about partisan and racial identities and the way that those are almost in contest with one another now to where people feel the loyalty is going. The, the, the popular stat that gets thrown around a lot now is that in 1960, 5% uh, of Republicans and 4% of Democrats said they would be upset if their child married someone of the other party. Uh, at the same time, 4% of Americans thought it was OK, uh, thought interracial marriage was OK. So it was like, you can't marry that black dude, but I don't care if you marry a Republican. Now it's flipped. It's yeah. like 50% um, of Republicans would be upset if their child married someone from the other party, a third of Democrats. But something like uh, upwards of 80% of Americans, 86, 87%, are, they are OK with interracial marriage. So, so we've, I don't, yeah, is, is that progress or, or not? But, but as these identities compete, I mean, we, we have more minority Republicans in the last few years than we haven't otherwise. Um, how does that reshape? or refashion our democracy? Or is this just the latest adaptation mm -hmm. of our citizenry to a very unfair, non-democratic system? Yeah. Hi, my name is Jamel. I know some of you. Um, I guess, you know, long time listener, first time caller. Uh, <laughs> my question's for the group. So the, the point earlier about how Jim Crow doesn't just like immediately happen after 1877. There's a kind of a long overhang from Reconstruction. And within that long overhang, there is uh, sort of like things can go many different ways. Doesn't have to end in Jim Crow, doesn't have, could have ended in a very different place. And so my question is if, if like, if the present period is sort of this long overhang from the civil rights movement that we're kind of like working through a series of different sort of reactions and actions and actions and reactions, what, you know, beyond the optimistic path, what, what like negative paths do you see coming out of this moment? What things are percolating that are very bad um, that are happening in this moment that could uh, end up, uh, you know, uh, becoming monstrous 20 or 30 years down the, ro down the road? 
That's a great question. So, I mean, I think that um, one of the things, I mean, so I think what I want to say is that we shouldn't say it's the overhang of Reconstruction. Reconstruction ends and something different begins. And really recognize that moment as being distinct in and of itself. And I think the second thing is that not only is it, you can call it redemption, but it's also the first Gilded Age. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, I think, you know, is this the neo-redemption era, which is an article, of a, an article I just wrote, uh, titled an article I just wrote, or is it the, the second Gilded Age, right? That it's not only racial, massive racial and ethnic inequalities, but it's also massive ec economic inequalities, that it's the, the sort of precarious nature of, of labor against capital, um, all sorts of things that are going on both then and now. I mean, I think, I think we're going to see another housing, some more housing shenanigans. Um, mm. I think that the kind of, I mean, there's never regulation really in this country, but the little bit of regulation um, that was kind of in place, kind of sorta, of, I think we just, I think, I think when you blow the lid on the idea that you have to regulate anything in the market, any type mm -hmm. of appeal to regulation for safety reasons, mm -hmm. um, to kind of keep the health of the, the kind of the, the so-called middle class, I think that is gone. Um, I, I think that now that we have a Department of Justice that doesn't really believe in civil rights, the quarter of an inch that we made on police brutality, like these consent decrees were all like ripped up the second mm -hmm. that Sessions came in. That kind of stuff that was the outgrowth of people's power, I think people are watching that school burn in front of them. And my concern is that the kind of heavy lift to get to that point, it will take us an, a decade before people can reconstitute themselves to do that lifting again. Mm -hmm. And that, that I find heartbreaking. Yeah, I think that trying to disentangle um, how people's attitudes can be can mm -hmm. shift so much depending on framing and you know political expediency. Um, we live in a time where I guess it's not okay theoretically, according to all these public opinion polls, to be openly racist, but it is totally okay to be very hostile towards members of the opposite <laughs> party. And people who study affective polarization don't really know what to do with this because this is a form of bias. They now see it in like employment applications mm -hmm. and all sorts of different things that it plays itself out. These, this partisan bias um, is sort of a stand-in for former forms of discrimination. It's now totally okay. But I think the problem, as, as you point out, of different negative pathways and what Marsha was saying is that as we open the field of sort of permissible discourse, or not permissible, but legitimate, you know, everything is permissible, obviously. But when um, there are things that people say that in the past, you know, I lived, I grew up in Georgia, I was, you know, there when the Confederate flag was removed from the Georgia flag, it used to be like part of it, um, these debates and stuff that we thought were settled, for them to be reopened um, and uh, to have to resurrect Confederate history as like a thing that we legitimately talk about, I mean, it's, it's crazy. It's not something I really thought I would see in my lifetime. And um, you, especially with the rise of different forms of technology, uh, the spread of different kinds of rhetoric and discourse and combined with a distrust of facts or news or whatever um, means that a lot of the space for ideas is really up for grabs. And yeah. I think that we know people still have biases, whether they're implicit or explicit, and what, you know, <coughs> what they overlay on top of them changes. But we're in a weird inflection point where things that were not OK or were previously settled seem to be sort of OK again. Yeah, perfect example of that is the, this recent debate about the intellectual inferiority of, of black people, you know, based on DNA. That one just It's been die. around yeah. since forever. But now it's like, well, but if we have this, all this great data and science, maybe we can craft better policy that can address the needs. And, and so this is, this is recycled state. history yeah. all right. over again. Yeah. Question? Yes, in the back. Christian was next, I think? Yeah, let's go to the back and then we'll come forward. Um, hi, Jeremy Young. I'm an investigative journalist with Al Jazeera. Um, you guys talked a little bit about voter suppression and voter disenfranchisement, but I'm wondering if you can talk about it a little bit more. Um, you know, the idea that there's a trope nowadays that there's voter fraud, uh, which is a totally non-existent thing, and this effort to keep people of color from casting ballots by, you know, restricting early voting, uh, not allowing voting on Sundays, things that are, are, are very straightforward efforts to keep people of color from voting. 
Um, can you talk a little bit about it and, and your thoughts on it and um, whether there's any reason to think that our country will progress on this issue? Thanks. Yeah, I think the, the, the question of who gets right. to vote has long been a, a, a question the nation has wrestled right. with since its inception. And so we're, we're just sort of in the next iteration of can it. I, can I push the, the voter disenfranchisement thing? I think that is important, but I sometimes wonder if, I, I love that that issue has been able to surface to a level of kind of public conversation, but I think we need to ask what people are offered, like what are people voting for, and what, and, and the vote is both so powerful and then sometimes so cosmetic. Mm -hmm. um, because when I think about post-1965 and the election of black mayors, something that I write about in my book, it's also the very moment where aid to the cities are, is also kind of crumbling. So it's this idea mm -hmm. that the vote is a way to um, amplify your voice and your interests, but then there's a, an entire mechanism that strips the power from those choices. And so I think that we should be concerned about access to the vote but when we look at kind of local level control and power, we have to also think about what are the things that are not on the ballot? What are the things that are not in the hands of the voters that are also dictating their lives? The opening or the closing of a factory or of industry, of a prison that's being located, or um, a wastewater treatment that's being placed, you know, planned. Um, voters in Flint could mobilize, but do they have the power to vote on how they will receive their settlements if they receive their settlements. Like they're just doing kind of neurological testing on kids in Flint. And so I think that there's a way where the vote and all of its possibilities can be stripped away even if we had perfect voting systems available to everyone equally. That said, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I mean the vote is key. I mean, it's just, it's just key. I mean, whether or not there's substantive sort of heft behind that actual vote, I mean, in terms of policy outcomes, you know, that, that's, you know, that's true. Um, but you have to have the vote. I mean, it just, it's just, it's key. Yeah, and I, this is one of those projects, to go back to incrementalism, like Alberto Gonzalez was first tasked with, you know, under the Bush, right. first Bush administration, um, no, sorry, not HW, but baby Bush, <laughs> but his first administration. So uh, anyway, was tasked with trying to find these claims right. of voter fraud and go after them. He wasn't very successful, but I just mean this has been a, and then so then activists went to the states and that's where they started getting voter ID laws passed through state legislatures. And fortunately, this Chris Kobach election commission thing didn't work, didn't get off the ground. And so I'm, I'm hoping that this is sort of, at least on the federal level, dead in the water. But um, yeah, there's just these, this, these efforts that are really long running, that on the right, they're very well organized in you know, these right to work laws in the states, so that ALEC, the American Legislative Executive Exchange Council, sorry, to get various kinds of pro-industry laws passed by state legislatures. You know, there's this nice grassroots organization they have to, to get through some long held ideological commitments of theirs, including, you know, disenfranchisement or voter right, you know, cleaning up the vote, but disenfranchisement. And can I just jump in that it's, it's, it's voter suppression of, of people of color, but it's also voter suppression of, of, of urban places. Right. That this is, I mean, this has been going on since the turn of the 20th century, that basically rural places, and many states rural places don't really like urban spaces, um, and that, that if we talk about a, a group like ALEC, right, that they are working with the sort of rural interests to kind of push forward a certain kind of agenda which works against those people who live in metropolitan areas. So it's, yes, it's voter suppression of, of um, people of color, but it's also the minimization of the political power of metropolitan places as well. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. It was so wonderful. Um, you know, the spirit of the conversation um, seemed to be kind of talking about the distinction between comparative approaches and domestic approaches. And something that I'm thinking about is kind of how, what, or, or what that says to me is that there is a moment at which racial discrimination kind of bleeds over into our foreign policy interests as well. Mm -hmm. So could you all spend a little bit of time talking about how democratic backsliding affects people of color at home but also affect our interests abroad, and maybe think, and maybe kind of tease that out a little bit. That, I think that would be really helpful. Well, I, I'll tell you one of the examples that I I love 
the most um, as, a, as a descriptive of this is in the, um, during JFK's administration when uh, newly free African nations were sending their first ambassadors to the United States. And those ambassadors would have to sort of get their papers blessed in Washington, but then go to the UN in New York. This was before a lot of air travel, so they would drive from Washington to New York. And there's a strip in northern Maryland. Um, Route that's, 40. Yeah, yeah, that's just, it's, it's just a different part of Maryland. And, and so um, highly segregated along there. And um, when these African delegations would stop off for restaurants or for mm -hmm. hotels, they would be told, you can't be served. And so the Kennedy administration, after being told so many times that these uh, delegations have been disrespected, talked to the governor of Maryland, and they eventually desegregated that strip of highway, the restaurants and the hotels, for the African delegation. But if you were a black student at Coppin State or Morgan State driving to New York or, or wherever, you still could not be served. Uh, and so this is, a, it was in the nation's interest, especially during the Cold War, where you have the, the United States telling the world that we are a place of freedom, land of the free, home of the brave, democracy, liberty, et cetera, and the Russians poking at the sore, open sore, mm -hmm. saying that you are not actually free, um, where the nation basically desegregated a, a section of itself specifically for its international interests while maintaining uh, domestic segregation because of its domestic interests. Uh, for lack of a better term. So that's an example of how even in the international space where there's progress, um, the, nation doesn't, it, it, the nation doesn't always follow suit immediately. Uh, I, I argue that eventually the Cold War was one of the main reasons the civil rights movement, Great Society legislation was successful because that the soft power, we were bleeding it at a pretty profuse rate. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think today the connections that come to mind is um, the composition of the military and what does it mean um, to have um, you know, a military that, that is indicative of the diversity of the country and then having these people going overseas with all this nonsense rhetoric happening, right? Like who's in most harm's way? And I think that, you know, the, you know, the, the, you know one of the many things that has, that's happened over the past two years that it's easy to forget, you know, Maisha Johnson as a yeah. black woman, um, you know, war widow and this kind of back and forth with the president, I think, um, that will be how that, that will be the opening anecdote for the book in 15 to 20 years about this very connection and that kind of long kind of story from Route 40 desegregation to the point of what does it mean when we have an active military of color under this kind of presidency. And, you know, I think about it in terms also about some of the concerns about racial discrimination at the military academies. And I remember going to the Air Force Academy, and they're saying, you know, we really want to diversify this academy, and it made us think that maybe we need to train people a little bit differently. Mm -hmm. To have, you know, some of these white mm -hmm. officers getting in the faces mm -hmm. of these black guys, it has a different tone. Mm -hmm. And so there's this way in which I think the, the kind of the racial baggage of the nation then spills out into the one area that I think you can get the most work on civil rights, and that's the military. And I think some of those dynamics are being reproduced today. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, this will be our, we'll get this question and we'll take these two at the same time and then sort of answer and, and sort of roll up your last thoughts together. Hi, Stephen Schafferman with the Basic Income Guarantee Network. Uh, Martin Luther King in his last book suggested that the problems of housing, education, racism could be resolved if we had a guaranteed income. And I'd just like to hear your thoughts going forward in the positive direction on the idea of a universal basic income and uh, what impacts that could have on democracy and race and so on. Very good. And uh, that question back there. Good afternoon. Thanks for being here. I'm uh, Maria. I work at Independent Sector. It's an infrastructure organization for the charitable sector. Um, so I kind of want to ask a question uh, related to the charitable sector. Um, within the past year, especially post-2016 elections, the charitable sector um, has a variety of organizations in it. Um, we have foundations, nonprofits, but also a lot of faith-based organizations. Um, so the reaction post-2016 has been very uh, varied. We have a lot of members that are struggling to understand how they can facilitate um, programs that are 
reacting in the moment um, and allowing people to have conversations and increase democracy within their community um, because it is difficult for people on both sides to come together and have a discourse. But how can we get organizations um, within the charitable sector not only to mobilize discussions and understanding, but move towards action that is going to help us strengthen or revitalize our democracy? Yeah, yeah so the role of, of, of universal basic income and um, non-government organizations mm -hmm. in preserving are making our democracy more equal, our nation more equal, but also preserving the democracy itself. Well, I don't have much specific to say on those questions, except to, if we think about a democratic consolidation framework, you know, a lot of people are talking about democratic backsliding, but political science has thought a lot about after a moment of democratic transition, it takes a long time, and it's arguable as to whether or not we ever reached a state of full democratic consolidation in the US. Um, but things that you definitely need are, first of all, constant generation of new policy ideas, and second of all, you do need uh, important intermediary organizations, like a dense network of civil society groups, not only because they help to prop up uh, you know, institutions like parties or elected officials, but also because they are laboratories of democracy themselves. They help orient citizens towards politics and to act dem little d democratically within their own various kinds of spheres. Um, and I, we have seen the decline of both of those things in the United States in the past few decades. So uh, a lot of the work of new policy is being done by social movements, protest politics, return to the kinds of, uh, you know, sort of outside of mainstream politics that allow citizens to think much more aggressively and creatively about what needs to be done to provide economic solutions in this, you know, globalized time in which we live, um, and also how organizations that are outside of politics can be most effective, and I think that placing loud demands on political leaders to be responsive is sort of the first and most important step, um, because that's sort of the critically missing nexus right now. I think at the heart of both of these questions is, uh, is this idea of paternalism that can, that can grow out of both kind of ideas. Um, a universal basic income that trusts the recipients of that income to make choices that are effective for themselves and the community that they're responsible for, I think can be an incredibly powerful tool, but I don't know if we're quite there yet to imagine trust in the poor, mm -hmm. trust in the economically unstable and precarious to make the right choices, because if they don't conform to our ideas of what investing in the future looks like, I think there can be some real disconnects. And I think about this in terms of conversations about reparations that we're having with Georgetown and thinking about slavery in universities. Everyone wants to create a trust fund. No one wants to give direct cash payments to anyone. I like to have my money in direct cash payment, I, and, and so should other people. So I think that there's a kind of paternalism that is embedded sometimes into these ideas that we have to really think about. And in the charitable sector, I think that there has to be a conversation about are we desiring collaboration or coalition building? Because those are two things. And some problems necessitate one strategy over the other because of the efficiency of it. But I think that what we're seeing is some real strained coalitions because there's varied interests, but if we can move into the collaborative space, we can kind of work out the tensions before the problems come. I think in this climate, that's a lot, of, that's a lot to ask for because there's so many things to react to, but I think our organizations really need a balance between collaboration and coalition building. Um, so Megan Francis wrote this really great book yeah. about the NAACP, and I think one of the important points that she makes about this, the early founding of the NAACP is that it, it's a brand new organization mm -hmm. and it really just doesn't know what it's doing. It's experimenting, it's trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work. And I think that in this moment of change, we have to be willing to recognize and nurture new organizations that are really speaking to and responding to what is needed today. Mm -hmm. um, that older organizations still are important, but I think that each moment demands its own responses. And so I think in terms of that sort of NGO, third sector, that you have to be sort of open and be sort of willing to say, you know what, maybe there's something that we're not seeing and we need to nurture it in this new organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think the other question, so it's uh, my, my son is a senior in AP government, and he just texted me a question, does poverty cause racism or racism cause poverty? I'm like, oh, I think you're trying to like answer an essay question. I'm not sure <laughs> <what it is. laughs> and I, and it, so I think that um, 
you know, it would be great if everyone had a basic income. Um, would that less necessarily lead to an end of racial inequality or racism? Which I, you weren't asking, but I, but I, but I just want to sort of say that that's not the case. Um, mm -hmm. That there are, again, many sort of psychic benefits. It's a hell of a drug. Bigotry, prejudice, racism, whatever you want to call it. Um, so yes, I would be in favor of a basic income, but I don't think mm -hmm. it is, leads to the sort of promised land that a number of different kinds of advocates are, are saying that it would lead to. Yeah, I, I, I think um, that what the, these suggestions here are ways to manage inequality, ways to manage mm -hmm. the, 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 race, the discrimination people experience. Um, but the problem of racism in the United States is a, it's a character flaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, until we, we decide that the American promise should be extended equally to everyone, um, solutions that we come up with are just ways of managing the pain mm -hmm. instead of uh, curing the, the mm -hmm. disease. Yeah, so thank you all for, for spending some time. Thank you, Dean.